we should do. But politically, that consensus has been arrived at. I acknowledge there was not that consensus in the 60s. There is today. There's a second thing that we all have agreed upon, and that is unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, born out of wedlock, without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing, because they literally, I yield myself three more minutes, because they literally have not been socialized, they literally have not had an opportunity. We should focus on them now, not out of a liberal instinct for love, brother, and humanity, although I think that's a good instinct, but for simple, pragmatic reasons. If we don't, they will, or a portion of them will, become the predators 15 years from now. And Madam President, we have predators on our streets that society has, in fact, in part because of its neglect, created. Again, it does not mean because we created them that we somehow forgive them or do not take them out of society to protect my family and yours from them. They are beyond the pale, many of those people. Beyond the pale. And it's a sad commentary on society. We have no choice but to take them out of society. And the truth is, we don't very well know how to rehabilitate them at that point. That's the sad truth. You're looking at the fellow who was one of the primary architects of the Sentencing Commission. You know what the basic premise of the Sentencing Commission is? I know the presiding officer knows. It was the first time in 80 years we rejected the notion that the condition of sentencing must be related to how long it would take to rehabilitate. I'm the guy that said rehabilitation. When it occurs, we don't understand it and notice it. And when we do, when we notice it. So what were the origins of forced sterilization and how widespread was its use across the United States? To discuss this, we're joined by Stephen Selden, the author of Inheriting Shame, the story of eugenics and racism in America. Joining us from Atlanta, Paul Lombardo, a bioethics and legal scholar. And our third guest, John Rayleigh, is the co-author of an investigative series titled Against Their Will. It was a special investigative report into North Carolina's sterilization program. And a side note here, many of the historical photos you'll see in this program are courtesy of the Image Archive from the American Eugenics Movement and the Southern Conference Education Fund. John Rayleigh then, first of all, what happened in North Carolina? There seemed to be quite a bit of support for some form of compensation from the governor and from the House, and yet we have this decision. Yes, it's a black eye to North Carolina, what happened this week, she had. It's, um, it's devastating. I mean, we had pushed this for 10 years. The victims, supporters, um, we had it all the way up the hill, and um, the House, under House Represent, um, the Speaker of the House, Tom Tillis, had worked hard on it, set it up in his chamber. Overwhelming vote passed a few weeks ago. He had $10 million in his budget. The governor had $10 million in her proposed budget. And in the Senate, despite our pleas from our paper, all papers all across the state, victims were calling his office. He does virtually nothing with it. The state Senate did virtually nothing with it. They never seriously considered it. And when they came out with their budget compromise, the money was not there. Here's one of the justifications for the decision from Republican State Senator Chris Carney. Uh, he said, we all agree with the fact that an apology is certainly appropriate, but I don't think that makes us any more sorry because we attach a dollar figure to it. Is that the sort of argument that we were hearing then? It is, and it's ludicrous. I mean, you know, in this country, money is the way we say we are sorry for what happened and we're going to, you know, we're going to make amends. I mean, we have lawsuits. Um, we just had a soldier in Afghanistan, um, for whatever reason, kill a bunch of innocent civilians. They got $50,000 each within weeks. Professor Lombardo, another reason w was, was uh, put forward, though. State Senator Austin Allrand said, if you start compensating people who've been victimized by past history, I don't know where that would end. Was, was there some sort of fear then of, of wider reparation claims from, from, from other sections of society? Well, I don't think there's ever a time when people will quit making claims for compensation, but this is relatively unique. You have a small group of people who have been identified. Uh, they don't go on forever. They're dying off pretty quickly, in fact. And in most states, they've already died. So I think worrying, worrying about how long this is going to stretch out is, is really just hypothetical. 
I, I suppose what's so interesting is North Carolina was seen as really setting the standard on this issue because at least they were considering compensation. Other states haven't even offered an apology, really, have they? Yes, it's true. Um, there are go ahead, Professor. more than 30 states, more than 30 states who had laws like this and did sterilize people, and only seven of them have stepped up and even recognized that they did it, made some kind of apology, or at least uh, uh, said that what they did was wrong. All right, Professor Selden, let's, let's try and understand how this became so widespread as a policy. Uh, and I, I guess we have then to go to the late 19th century with the emerging, quote, science of, of eugenics, and then the early 20th century with the, the emerging science of genetics through Gregor Mendel. How does all this fuse to, to reach what we see in North Carolina? So in the 18th North century, Mendel's work on peas is, becomes known at 1900. Right. Uh, in the late 19th century in England, um, uh, the eugenics movement begins. Uh, and it moves across the ocean to the United States where it, where it was positive in England, marrying best with best. In the U.S., we have positive and negative eugenics, marry best with best, and keep those who are judged to be inferior from reproducing. Uh, by the early 20th century, the American eugenics movement begins to uh, operate, and it popularizes eugenics nationally uh, in fairs, uh, in, uh, for ministers who give um, uh, speeches on it. So uh, what, what are the yeah. intellectual justifications then for, for taking something, a science that was basically about plants, frankly, and, and then juxtapos and sort of transposing that to humans? Then? The proposition was that all human traits were much like the traits of peas, and so you simply had to remove those that were inferior. The science of that particular science was, was wrong. And by the early part of the 20th century, likely before the first decade, biologists knew it was wrong. But they didn't associate themselves with the eugenicists. So you had a, a separation between those who supported eugenics and the biologists who saw the eugenicists as, as not scientists at all. And this really did catch on. I mean, it became enormously influential, almost part of what was the accepted scientific norm on American campuses, perhaps, and, and, and just, you know, just a fact of life that this is what you yes. could do. Yes, there were uh, college courses on eugenics and in the American high school textbooks of the period, uh, eugenics was thought to be a legitimate science. And was it always then imbued with racism? Biological determinism, which is the argument that's being made here, we are determined by our biology, is the basis for racism. So races are different biologically and therefore we can make judgments about those who are superior and inferior. As it became then the, the norm then, the intellectual norm, uh, it, it also received a great deal of funding from the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Harrimans and these, you know, these major, um, ma major um, families in in the U.S. What were they? I mean, Professor Lombard. I mean, the, the, they were funding these, you know, these handsomely funded institutes then around uh, the U.S. who were collecting records, genetic records on people and so forth. What were those records being collected for? With a view to doing what exactly? Well, the desire of the funding sources was for people to be able to understand how heredity worked. Um, heredity then as now is something that people get very excited about. The, if the idea that was accepted in an, in an era when most people in America lived on farms was that like produces like, if you have a prize steer and a prize bull, you put them together and you get prize calves. Uh, this idea was generally accepted. and. The people who were putting the funding forth felt like studying how this concept worked in human beings was a good idea. But be able to understand how we could breed for the best was something they thought was worth putting their money into. How did it make the leap then, Professor, from um, academia and the wealthy classes into the legislative framework? ...on the monoclonal antibodies. The real question that people uh, quite clearly interested in is what is the impact on the vaccine? And so far, literally, we have this new phenomenon that are preprint journals where, where people get data and they put it into a preprint server where it hasn't yet been peer reviewed. But you have to pay attention to it because it gives you good information quickly. Ultimately, it gets confirmed. And we're seeing them coming out over the last few days. And what they're saying is that what we likely will be seeing is a diminution more South Africa than UK. UK is that diminution in what would be the efficacy of the vaccine-induced antibodies. Now, that does not mean that the vaccines will not be effective. And let me explain why. There's a thing called a cushion effect. 
So if you have a vaccine like the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine that can suppress the virus at a dilution, let's say, of one to a thousand, and the mutant influences it by bringing it down to maybe one to, to 800 or something like that, you're still well above the line of not being effective. So there's that cushion that even though it's diminished somewhat, it still is effective. That's what we're seeing both certainly with the UK, which is very minimal effect. We're, why we're following very carefully the one in South Africa, which is a little bit more concerning, but nonetheless not something that we don't think that we can handle. What is the message? Because someone could say, now wait a minute, if you have the possibility that the vaccines are diminishing in their impact, why are we vaccinating people? No. It is all the more reason why we should be vaccinating as many people as you possibly can. Because as long as the virus is out there replicating, viruses don't mutate unless they replicate. And if you can suppress that by a very good vaccine campaign, then you could actually avoid this deleterious effect that you might get from the mutations. Bottom line, we're paying very close attention to it. There are alternative plans if we ever have to modify the vaccine that is. Let's go to a couple of questions that we've actually received since we started the, the webcast. Uh, the first is on population growth. And the question is, one of our most press, pressing issues is population growth. How do you uh, expect this to be addressed? Well, the population growth issue at the global level it's not that daunting. That is, the population percentage-wise is growing slower today than in the past. And so it will actually peak out. The problem is that the population is growing the fastest where people are less able to deal with it. So it's in the very poorest places that you're going to have a tripling in population by 2050. And so their ability to feed, educate, provide jobs, stability, protect the environment in those locations mean uh, you know, they're faced with an almost impossible problem. Northern Nigeria, Yemen, Chad. Uh, and so what we need to do is take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size, and improve health because it's amazingly, as, as children survive, parents feel like they'll have enough uh, kids to support them in their old age, and so they choose to have less children. Niger right now, it's still seven children per family, whereas in the richer countries, uh, you're often at, at a stable point of, which is 2.1 or, or even less. And so it's really an acute problem in a, a certain number of places, and we've got to make sure uh, that we help out with the tools now so that they don't have an impossible situation later.